So the one thing that allowed us to really unlock growth was building a repeatable go-to-market playbook from how we find customers, engage customers, get them on board, make them successful. That one go-to-market playbook got us from probably zero to $20 million. There are some metrics you can look at. Do you start to see ARR grow? Do you start to see sales efficiency happen? Interestingly, what I found is the way you know is you feel it. You feel the momentum. It's a blast. My name is Bob Tinker. I am a multi-time entrepreneur. Probably the one I'm most well-known for is being the founding CEO of a company called Mobile Iron, which we started in 2008 and grew from zero to $150 million of ARR over the course of five years and took it public on NASDAQ. So in 2014, we went public. In 2016, uh, we missed our numbers. We lost like half of our market capitalization. It was really painful. And as CEO, that responsibility was on me. In that board meeting, I said, hey, one of the things we should talk about is whether I should be the CEO of Mobile Iron going forward. And then probably 60 days later, Tehi came back to me and said, you know, Remember that conversation we had in the board meeting? We're gonna take you up on that. Bob is so gifted, he can compensate for a lot of people and he was doing a lot himself. But what was really needed was uh, to replace some of his executives. And that was a hard decision for him. There are a lot of things that uh, Bob, uh, because he's uh, so talented, can change easily. So if it's anything related to him personally, he can internalize it and knows how to change. For example, how you manage someone in the beginning of a company, you have to micromanage every detail as CEO of the company. And so he's very good at that because he's smart. But at the same time, as the company uh, grows, then he's good at delegating and uh, uh, just managing, setting goals and metrics. So he made that transition very easily, which many founder CEOs have a hard time transitioning, you know, how to give up control. What was hard for Bob is uh, uh, changing great people. What I mean by that is, if you have someone who just struggles, it's easy to say, you know that person's struggling, we gotta make a change. But what happens if you have someone who did a fantastic job, but because the company grew, the job changed, and that person's not changing? So the person was a, a superhero yesterday, but is struggling today. And there is hard to change because you feel so much loyalty for that person. And so that is a, an emotionally tough decision to do, is to change people that were great that are struggling today. After I stepped aside from running Mobile Iron, like a lot of entrepreneurs after a run like that, I was tired. I took some time off, that helped. But interestingly, I also wanted to teach. Like there was a lot of things I learned in my time at Mobile Iron that I wanted to share. And there was also some things about sort of my experience in being an early stage CEO that were frustrating that inspired me and Tehi to write two books. I had two big frustrations in being an entrepreneur. The first frustration was I felt like companies go through stages where things change. I was always struggling to sort of understand what's next. Because as CEO, you're always working on what's happening right now, but you also have to be looking over the hill to figure out what's next. And how do you make sure you get to that next stage? And I didn't really feel like there was any good content out there or investors are really good at helping me on that. The second thing that was a big frustration was this gap between product market fit and unlocking growth. I was mad that nobody told me about how do you solve for that? They're like, get to product market fit and hire salespeople and go. I was like, that didn't work. And I was mad being able to use that frustration and what we learned from that about repeatable go-to-market playbook to unlock growth and finding go-to-market fit, that was sort of the second frustration. The third frustration, which is that as the company changes, your job changes so the people have to change. The thing that surprised me on that was how hard it is to unlearn. We spend most of our time learning, 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 it's really important. But one of the things we don't talk about is what do we need to unlearn? That was a big, uh, lesson for me. I'll give you a specific example. Let's take VP of sales. So in the beginning, ideal VP of sales that you need is someone who's like a, a pioneer or an explorer. Someone that can find a path through the wilderness, you know, to the promised land. The person that can survive with no map, 
doesn't need a lot of supplies. It's not worried about Indians, uh, hostiles, but will find that path through the wilderness. So it's an explorer type person. And usually that person's good at managing a couple of sales reps and so forth. As soon as you find that path through the wilderness, you don't want someone that's a pioneer type leader. Instead, what you want is, you want someone like Mel Gibson in Braveheart. You want a warrior leader. You want now to go down this path like 50 warriors that will go and fight against the bigger enemy, your, the bigger competitors and win deal. But once you have like uh, 50, 100 warriors and you're growing, the kind of VP of sales you want is not a warrior leader, but someone who's good at managing warrior leader. <laughs> that kind of profile is someone like Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was the commander of uh, the Allied forces in World War II on the Western Front. So he commanded the US Army, the British Army, Canadian Army, French Army, on the Western Front. But it turns out, he never fought in battle. He was never a warrior, but he was very good at managing warrior leaders. And so if you hired a Dwight Eisenhower at the beginning with two sales reps, it would be a total disaster because that person's trying to build structure, process, like think like a big company when you don't even have a path through the wilderness. And so this is what I mean by at the companies at different stages, you need different skill sets. It's about how to prevent someone from being a superstar today and being fired tomorrow. Yeah, some tips for sort of unlearning and helping teams navigate through these change points. The first thing is recognizing when one of your leaders is going through one of these change points where they have to unlearn their old role and learn their new role. The second thing, and this is really hard, is sometimes people don't want to unlearn. They're actually just really good at their job and they wanna keep doing their old job. And the problem is you as the leader, you're like, well, actually I need you to do the next job, but they're not willing to unlearn. You know, as the company changes, their job changes. So the people have to change to adapt to their job. And if not, you have to change the people. And that's hard. If the people aren't willing to change, you have to change the people. So as a result, some of your leaders and execs will make the leap. The other thing that happens is sometimes your execs or leaders either won't or can't make that leap and you have to let them go. And that's hard because you have these leaders that have been a big part of your company and helping it make it become the company it's become so you feel super loyal to them and you wanna give them a chance to make it to the next level. But at some point, if they're not able to, you have to let them go and that's hard. The trick on this is how much time do you give them? And uh, this is tricky for a CEO because as CEO, there's sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you take action too quickly and let them go too quickly, you're not willing to work with them, not willing to let them learn, and you're kind of a jerk. If you take too long to let them figure it out, you're weak and you don't make decisions. <laughs> so there's sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. My experience on this is you have about 90 days to give a leader a chance to step up and unlearn their old role and learn their new role. Otherwise, you have to make the change. It's hard. You have to be respectful of the executive, thank them for what they did, be really appreciative, give them an honorable exit. But the reality is sometimes, um, the best thing for them is to go do their role again somewhere else. And it's one of the great things about Silicon Valley and entrepreneurial communities is sometimes there are people that are really great VPs of sales from zero to 50 million. And having them try and be the VP of sales from 50 to 150 million, they just don't wanna do that job. It's a different job. So the best thing for them to do is to leave and go be the VP of sales somewhere else from zero to 50 million. Now, the second category is people who are willing to unlearn and learn. And it's spectacular if you have a leader that's willing to do that. Some of the most fun you'll ever have as an exec is working with one of your leaders that's able to make this leap. The first piece of advice on it is let them know this change is happening. Your job is going through a change and therefore you have to change. The second thing is get them a good mentor because having them talk with other leaders like themselves that have been through this change is super helpful to them to be able to get feedback from the outside to kind of know what to look for and how to change and how to think about it. The third piece of advice on this is help them know what the new job looks like and what the things are that they need to do and to have a conversation with them about what are the things are that need to change. And being explicit about that helps them understand what needs to change, but also helps create a really nice, powerful relationship between you and that leader who's making the leap. Because being able to make those step functions where you're unlearning and learning is 
typically a step function in somebody's career. By being able to do that, they've earned the right to play at the next level. That's really fun when you see somebody uh, able to do that. It doesn't mean they're always capable of doing it, but it's really fun when you get a chance to see them do that. So in the beginning of the company, when the company's up to like 20, 25 people, the best uh, founder CEO is like Captain America. Someone who goes out there, leads by example, fights everything. So the ideal founder CEO in the morning is talking to customers, in the afternoon is telling engineers what code to write, and the evening is writing code himself or herself. So it's just right there with the people. It's great inspirational leadership, fast decision making, everything is aligned and it just, it works very well. So the ideal CEO profile is Captain America. As the company gets bigger, you can't maintain that structure because the founder has too much control. It soon will grow beyond the founder. And so the next type of profile is you want a founder who's good at leading a band of Avengers. So you want each VP to have a superpower that's even more powerful than the CEO. And so, you know, you want the VP of marketing to be a better marketer than the CEO. You want the VP of sales to be a better salesperson than the CEO. And so you want a CEO then to lead a band of Avengers rather than being Captain America. And so to do that, it's about how you delegate but still maintain control. In the first phase, it's about managing tasks. That's what a Captain America will do. The next phase is about setting the right goals, watching the right metrics, to make sure that you can empower people, but you can still have accountability and visibility. Then as the company gets even bigger, what you want as the CEO, who's like Professor Xavier in X-Men, and you're building a school of superheroes so that you know, it's not just your executives, but a broader team of uh, uh, emerging superheroes throughout the organization. And to do that, vision and culture become very important because for the CEO to set goals for everyone means you undercut the hierarchy. The CEO then can take leadership with the vision and culture and to make it grow even bigger. So this is what we talk about, how the CEO role changes and if you try to have it be Professor Xavier on day one, then the company will struggle. So being a CEO is uh, it's a tough job. The CEO is always making decisions. Some decisions are easy, some decisions are hard. Some decision you have no idea what the right answer is and you just have to pick something. The other thing about being CEO is it's exhausting. I learned a couple of interesting things about just being a CEO and what it means for you personally. The first thing is that it's a fascinating exercise in self-awareness. To be able to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, what am I doing well, what am I not doing well? Like, <laughs> it's a fascinating exercise in that. The second thing is that it's really hard to draw boundaries in your life because I call it the Saturday morning problem. You have four hours on a Saturday morning. How do you spend it? Do you spend it hanging out with your family, hanging out with friends, doing the things you want to do personally? Or do you spend it on helping make the company better? Because there's 900 families that are depending on the company. That creates a low grade stress for you as a CEO. The third thing I learned is that being a good CEO requires a level of sort of schizophrenia. Because on one hand, you need to be super optimistic and be an inspiring leader to point people at the mountain and be like, let's climb that mountain together. But on the other hand, you also need to be kind of paranoid, looking over your shoulder at all the things that could go wrong and solving issues that are happening every day. When I add it all up and sort of look at it, the ability to be part of building a company that makes a difference for customers, that creates value for shareholders, you get to bring a great team together, you get to see them grow and learn, like, there's a lot of crap that happens and a lot of hard stuff. My advice for CEOs is be able to zoom out. Because I found like when I was in the soup bowl, sort of just dealing with all the day-to-day -day stuff, it always seemed like there's all sorts of issues and stuff like that going on. But when I zoomed out and looked at where were we a year ago and where are we now? And I'm like, oh my God, look at all the progress we made. Like that filled up my gas tank and gave me energy. Everybody will have their own sort of personal things they do to stay mentally healthy. Um, some people exercise, some people sleep, some people socialize. You know, everybody's gonna have sort of their own routines for it. So I don't have a specific recommendation on that, but have a routine. <laughs> 
whatever it is. Um, the thing for me that helped, I guess, give me balance was spending time with family and friends. I'm an extrovert, I'm wired as an extrovert, so I get energy from that. So being able to spend time with my wife and kids and be able to spend time with my family is how I recharged myself. You know, I look back on sort of my journey as a first time CEO, it was crazy, it was hard, it was exhausting, but it was also a blast. Got to be part of building great business, got to learn a ton about myself, and I don't know this for sure or not, but I think what I learned on the journey actually made me a better person. So when we started uh, writing the books, Bob and I, we thought it was gonna take six months, not four years. It took us that long to reconcile our view of working on mobile iron and airspace. So even though we worked closely together on those two companies, um, it looked like we were watching two different movies. And so reconciling our two views uh, took four years. At the same time, we felt at the reconciliation would help. And what I mean by that is that one view is like the founder CEO. It's like the, the surfer who's like in the water riding the wave and the surfer's number one goal is don't wipe out versus the investor board member, uh, me, who's like in a helicopter above this surfer and maybe 20 surfers, but not in the water and sort of watching and saying, this is where the wave is going and trying to give direction. And so reconciling the founder invest, I mean, the board member investor and the founder CEO took four years. I think I have sort of three core pieces of advice for future entrepreneurs. The first one is start with a pain or problem, not a technology, because customers buy because of pain and problems or gain. The second big thing is figure out your own personal way to unlearn. Everybody sort of can figure out their own way to unlearn, but in order for you to be successful, you're gonna have to figure out how to unlearn what made you successful and learn what's next. And you're just gonna have to figure that out for yourself. Third thing is do your best to surround yourself with good people, both in your work life that you wanna spend time with and in your personal life. Because at the end of the day, the thing I am most proud of and the thing that I look back on and I remember the most is sort of the people that I worked with and the customers we made a difference with and the relationships I built. Now I'm now, how old am I now, 53? Yeah. You know, I think you've, at least how I'm sort of evaluating my success in life is not my balance sheet or my checkbook. It's actually the relationships I have that mean something to me. So plans for the future. Um, on the work side, uh, I started a small private equity shop called Metamorph, where we buy small software companies and help make them better. So on that point, we're looking to buy one or two companies and help make them better. And we're looking to make the companies we already bought even better. On the personal side, my wife and I are recent empty nesters, which is sort of an English term for when your kids leave home to go to university. I'm looking forward to visiting my kids at university and uh, being able to spend some time with my wife and my friends because uh, it's kind of wild to feel like you are just don't have kids anymore and uh, you get a chance to spend time with your friends and wife in a way that I haven't in 20 years. So that's my plan. Not super exciting, but for me, very satisfying.